What's up guys, John Haas, RNC Serian within RSNG.com. Today I am really excited to bring you an episode in our series on critical thinking and nursing care plans. Before we get rolling into the episode, I want to let you guys know that if you go to NRSNG.com slash critical thinking, that's NRSNG.com slash critical thinking, you will find a massive monster post on creating nursing care plans and how to apply critical thinking in nursing school. Now that's something that nursing professors and nursing schools love to mention. They love to mention you need to be critical thinking, but they don't ever really tell you how or how it applies. In this post, we've done that for you. That's nrsng.com slash critical thinking. And on that post as well, there is a free download of a care plan template that you can download and just fill in. It, it has all the spots where you can just fill in exactly uh, what you need to have, a, to have a really effective, good nursing care plan. That's nrsng.com slash critical thinking. All right. Now let's roll into this. This is another episode in our series on critical thinking and nursing care plan. So I hope you guys enjoy. All right, guys, welcome to this podcast about critical thinking. So I have worked on the floor. I have worked in the ICU. And by the way, my name is Katie Cleaver, <laughs> BSNRN, CCRN. So I have worked um, in various units and I've noticed my progression of critical thinking it looked a little different on each unit. And I kind of wanted to just go through a, a few scenarios, a few examples of things. Um, so you can kind of understand that progression. So let's talk in this episode, we're going to talk about three examples of my critical thinking on working on a nursing floor slash step down. So basically we could take care of step down patients, except they just couldn't have arterial lines or ventilators. Um, so it was basically cardiac step down. So one of the big things that the patients that I took care of was they were recovering from coronary artery bypass grafts or um, the cat. It's called the cabbage surgery. So one of the things that um, frequently happens after a patient has had this surgery is they flip into AFib. A approximately 30% of post-op patients that have had open heart surgery or coronary artery bypass grafts because cabbages are not open hearts, um, but they are heart surgery. Um, they can flip into atrial fibrillation. So what is atrial fibrillation? You can go to our cardiac course to check that out. But basically the atrial cells are irritated and they fire way too frequently. And so what happens is they flip into AFib. And the concern is, is they flip into AFib, but it's rapid AFib with, um, I'm sorry, it's AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular response. So the ventricles are responding rapidly. You see their heart rate and is, you know, 100, 120, 130, 160. And when we have a real high heart rate, we get real concerned about strokes. So when a patient flips into AFib with RVR, we get very concerned. Um, so I'm working on my patient. Things are going fine. I'm working night shift and I'm seeing that I looked at it. I did my tele strip at the beginning of the strip, normal sinus, eighties, nineties. Can't remember exactly what it was. And then later I'm like, Hey, wait, that doesn't look regular anymore. When I looked up at the telemetry, Hmm, wait, his heart rate's like 120. And our alarms were set at 125, so it hadn't alarmed on me. And we have telemonitors, but they routinely go through kind of systematically. So if this patient had flipped in the last few minutes, they may not have noticed. So I noticed they flipped into AFib. I noticed their heart rate was much higher. And then all of a sudden we're looking at, you know, now we're in AFib. And now we're in heart rate of 120. And now we're in a heart rate of 140. Uh-oh. Okay, the alarm's starting to go off on the monitor, and I'm starting to get a call from telemetry. Hey, your patient in bed 86 has a heart rate of 150, and they are in AFib. And all their job is to do is to tell me what to do. So I hung up the phone, and I, okay, let me think. I got to think. My problem is AFib. What are my interventions? What am I going to do about it? So I've got to critically think about this situation. 
while I have alarms going off in the back. All right, so I know i got to let the doctor know. Okay, but I've got to anticipate the questions the doctor is going to ask me. So before I call and page the physician, i got to kind of get my ducks in a row. Let me go get a set of vitals because I know the doctor is going to ask me, hey, is the patient symptomatic? Are they feeling any different? And what is their vitals? Or what are their vitals? So let me go do that and get that taken care of before I call the physician because I want to have these questions, the answers to these questions. So I go in, I assess my patient. Patient feels totally fine. They're actually surprised that I'm in there like, hey, kind of concerned. Um, So I, I decide, okay, I need to take their blood pressure. But so on the floor, a lot of hospitals have these machines where you put on the blood pressure cuff and it takes the blood pressure for you. But... When a patient is in rapid AFib with um, RVR, they those machines aren't really designed to read AFib appropriately, so you're not going to get an accurate blood pressure, and half the time it can't even read it. So instead of screwing around with that, I'm like, I'm just going to go take a manual blood pressure. So, and I need to know what were their blood pressures running beforehand, before we flipped into this? Did they have a normal pressure? Were they, you know, were they maybe 140s over 90s? Were they 130s, 120s? Or did they sit in the 90s? I need to know it was normal for this patient. So I'm kind of working through that, okay? And this is, sounds like it's taking a while, but this is happening very quickly. Take the blood pressure. I get an accurate blood pressure. I get a quick assessment on the patient. They're feeling fine, no symptoms. Take a peek at their labs. Okay, I'm going to go page the cardiovascular surgeon. Okay, so I page the surgeon and I page him and make sure that I can be at the bedside, or I'm sorry, be at the computer. So if they ask me about various lab values, I'm prepared to answer the questions. So page the surgeon. They call me back and, ah, well, what's the blood pressure? What's the potassium? What's the magnesium? What's, what's this? What's this? What's this? Um, okay, I want you to give a cardizem bolus and I want you to start the patient on five milligrams of a, a 10 milligram cardizem bolus and I want you to give, start them on a cardizem drip at five and I want you to titrate up to 15 um, to maintain a heart rate less than 120. If the heart, if they flip into normal sign, back into normal sinus, and we call that being chemically converted, um, don't just stop it. Give us a call back and we'll see what to do. Um, and if the blood pressure starts going down, just give us a call. Okay. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. So then I got to figure out critical thinking wise, who am I going to delegate this what can I delegate? I need to get this task done as quick as possible. My other patient put on the call light that wants a warm blanket. They've got to wait. The assessment I didn't chart on that other patient, it's got to wait. I've got to put these orders in. I've got to implement them quickly. And so you kind of realize with situations, hey, this is now a priority. Okay. They got I got a blood pressure. I need to check the blood pressures frequently. Okay, I'm going to give cardizem. If I'm not familiar with cardizem and administering it, I got to look up the policy for starting a cardizem drip or diltiazem drip. Um, okay, I got to critically think a little bit too. Let's say I have in my Pixis or in our med machine on our floor, I have cardizem boluses, but I don't have a drip. The pharmacy has to mix it. All right, when I put that order in, I got to put it in stat so they do it immediately. And I've also got to think about, um, okay, well, I have the bolus in hand. I don't want to give that until I have the the drip to start because if I push this cardizem right now and it takes 45 minutes or an hour to get my, um, uh, my bag, my drip, then it you know, that doesn't do much good if I'm trying to convert them and then I don't have anything to maintain them on it. So those are kind of little critical thinking pieces, um, you know, so I can actively work through this situation and, and seamlessly address this problem. So let's kind of review. So flipped into AFib, got vital signs, got an assessment, called the physician, got the orders, implemented the orders, knew to prioritize this over other things. This is a get done now thing. Um, knew 
when to call the physician again. They gave me when to call him back. Boom. So that's some critical thinking working through a patient that's flipped into AFib with RVR. So assess, um, call, intervene. My next one. <laughs> this is one I will never forget about. I wrote a book um, called Becoming Nursey from Code Blues to Code Browns, How to Care for Your Patients and Yourself, available on Amazon. <laughs> but one of the stories I tell in that book, I'm going to tell right now. Okay, so I had a patient, um, again, working on this unit again. He um, was brought into the hospital by his son because he wasn't acting right. And then when his son went over and he hadn't been over to his house in a long time, noticed he was living in filth, multiple wounds, wasn't caring for himself, but didn't let anybody know. And I guess, you know, people had been out of town and hadn't been over there in a while. So we get him to our unit because he was having a lot of pain in his foot and realized that he's got gangrene. And the phys the cardiovascular that he was being admitted by cardiovascular surgery. A lot of other physicians had been consulted because he had quite a few medical issues that had were underlying that weren't addressed. Um, so he kind of a complex guy in general. So he's my patient. I learned he's got I can't remember what he, he was on isolation for something, and I can't remember MRSA VRE or something like that. Um, so you had to be in your isolation gown and do all that. So he's rolling up to the unit. And I notice on assessment, um, you know, because they're, they're basically what I learned and gathered from the chart, that they think they're going to have to amputate the guy's foot because he's got gangrene, um, hasn't gotten blood flow down there, um, long-term diabetic uh, with neuropathy and everything. So, you know, I'm going in to take care of this patient like I take care of any of my other patients and do my assessment. And then I assess the foot in question. His other foot's fine, you know, it's diminished pulses, but not, um, you know, they're still palpable. And I could clearly hear them on my um, Doppler. So I get out my Doppler and try to t assess pulses. And I, while I'm doing that, because I'm pretty sure I can't find them, this ED nurse can't find them, but, you know, I thought I'd give it a whirl. And I'm looking at his foot, and I see something wiggling in his foot. Oh, my God, what is that? What is moving on his foot? And I'm a little bit of a newer nurse. Like, I'm not a veteran by any means at this time. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is a maggot in that man's foot. Like, I talk about keeping your nurse face together. <laughs> so I said to the man who, and he was kind of aloof. Like, I don't know if that was his like baseline neuro thing, but he was just like a little different. But anyways, I made some excuse to get out of the room because I was like, I had to process that. You know, he's totally stable. He's totally fine. I'm just doing my assessment. And, oh, my gosh. So I <laughs> I get out of the room and get out of my isolation gown. And I go up to the nurse's station. And I s desperately find someone that knows more than I do. <laughs> and I was like, um, I think he's got maggots in his foot. And oh, this story isn't really about my critical thinking. It's about someone else's. Because I was so shocked that I had no idea what to do. Newer nurse had never had a situation like this. And my my uh, the charge nurse that day, wonderful nurse, she's actually a nurse practitioner now. She said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I don't know exactly how to deal with these things either. So we are going to call infection control and ask them how we have to properly dispose of these things because it's not like we can just throw them in the trash. So, okay, good. Okay. All right. I get that. So we call them and then I, and she's also, we have to call the physician to make sure that they know um, because, you know, we need to make sure that they're aware that this is there. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So I, uh, so she's thinking practically critically. Okay. The guy has got an infectious or not actually an infection, but he's got this, um, 
insects. He's got things on his foot that we have to get rid of, and we have to think about the best way to get rid of them so that we're not screwing up our trash and we're not making problems worse. And let's let's think about practically how we're going to work through this. We have a problem, maggots. What are we going to do about it? So she calls. Well, actually, I called who I needed to call, and you know they said, "Hey, you need to collect them into." into a container and I just used like one of those UA cups and collect them into a container and then I can't remember what she said I had to pour something on them and um, count how many there are make sure I documented it appropriately and notify the physician so okay so I thought hey let me just let me do this first and know how many are there and how bad it is so I know that before I call the physician so if because of course they're going to ask me how many there are and if I haven't done it yet then you know so okay so we get all geared up and keep in mind it smells horrendous because it's essentially rotting flesh and it was a really stinky situation and actually you could even smell it in the hallways like we were spraying stuff a lot, but it was like you got about three doors down from the guy and you started smelling it. And if you weren't a healthcare professional, you probably had no idea what you were smelling. But essentially, it's rotting flesh. And sorry if I'm grossing you guys out. Sorry, not sorry. This is nurse life. Um, <laughs> um, so I we got gowned up. We put on the things we're supposed to put on. I We actually ended up putting masks on so that we could bear the smell because it was that bad. So we're working on his foot and it had dawned to me, I haven't even told this guy, like, I don't even know if he knows he's got maggots crawling out of his foot. So while I'm doing whatever it was, she told me to do it. Sorry, I can't remember exactly what it was. I'm like, sir, do you know that you have maggots in your foot? And he said, oh, no, I didn't know I was feeding a farm down there. <laughs> I... You know that little emoji where it's like the eyes are like two horizontal lines and the mouth is a longer horizontal? That was me. I was that emoji. Like, I don't uh, <laughs> I don't know how to... Okay. <laughs> so I had talked about how severe that is, how bad, you know, that's it's a big deal. You know, you, that means your skin is rotting and they're eating the dying flesh. And So I can't remember how many there were. And we got disposed of them a proper, properly. And then I called the physician like the person told me to and documented appropriately. And I thought, you know, the physician, I thought, was just going to lose his mind like I did. But it's a cardiovascular surgeon. I didn't think about this. Of course they've seen this before. So I tell him, like, oh, my God, we found eight or however many maggots in this guy's foot. <laughs> Without skipping a beat, the guy goes, gross, and hangs up. <laughs> Because he already knew how bad the foot was. He's pretty sure we were going to cut it off anyway. Like, okay, great. He's got maggots. They're just eating the dead flesh. Like, whatever. Like, I just I was so like, I can't believe I just did that. You don't even care. <laughs> so that was my uh, maggot foot story. Got a couple more in my book if you want to check them out. But my third and final critical thinking one um, so, again, back on that unit, um, and a lot of you may know what sundowning is. Alzheimer's or patients with dementia at night, they get more confused at night and um, get kind of can be hard to manage. So I had this patient, um, you know, typically you got your bed alarm on, you want people to sleep. Well, she woke up at night. She'd take some naps during the day, but she woke up at night. And I could not get this woman to, like be calm. And we didn't want to really medicate her with a bunch of Halidol. And, you know, it wasn't like she was super aggressive, but she was just up and picking at things and hitting the call light and messing with her IV and, and messing with this. So I'm sitting there with the nurses up front. Like, okay, I, even though she's in a room by the hall or by the nurse's station, I feel like it's not good enough. Like I can't, She's going to keep getting up and trying to get up. And she had already ripped out an IV. And, you know, she had to have the sequential compression devices on, but it's like she'd get tangled up in those. And when she had to pee, it was like, I have to get up right now. 
And she wouldn't wait. She wouldn't remember the call light. And it was like, you put the bed alarm on. If you put it on too sensitive, she was setting it off. It wasn't in every three seconds. But if you put it on the second step, she was halfway at the door by the time the alarm started. Like, she was quick. So it was like, I'm sitting there like, guys, I don't know what to do. Because I can't be in there all day. And we already needed, we needed a sitter for another patient. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get one for her. So what do I do? And it's not like she's aggressive or agitated. She's just like needs to be entertained. But I just, I can't sit in there with her for 12 hours. I've got four other patients I got to take care of. So I decided, hey, or actually, I don't know if I decided, but I was working through this with um, a couple other nurses, like, what can we do? And they're like, hey, why don't we get one of those cardiac recliners Let's put it up at the nurse's station. And it was night shift, so it wasn't like we had all these people coming in and out. Let's let's put her in front of the nurse's station. Let's put a bedside table over her and let her fold towels. Because I had given her, like, little tasks to do in there. And then when she'd get done, she'd just forget what to do and get up again. So that's what we did. And that kept her entertained for quite a while. And then eventually she was like, I... I want to go to bed. And then we just put her back in her room and she went to bed for the rest of the night. And it was wonderful. Um, you know, that's exactly what that patient needed. She didn't need restraint. She didn't need Halidol. She didn't need um, a sitter. She just needed something to do and someone to watch her. So that's what we did. And it worked wonderfully. And then during the day, she was fine because she did much better during the day. So there's just some ways that it was like, okay, here's our problem. The patient is getting up. Not aggressive, but... Uh, you know, definitely a fall risk hurting herself. What can we do to address this? Let's distract her and let's give her something to do and let's put her where we can see her and let's put her where someone always is. So if she needs something, someone can answer it right away. So those are just three kind of scenarios that working through on the floor where I was kind of working through critical thinking, identifying a problem. Here's a solution. Here's a way to attack the problem and address it and, and, and get to a solution. And how did that go? So I hope that kind of helps you understand critical thinking a little bit better from the perspective of the floor. I'm going to have another one where I talk about critical care and and how those situations are a little different. Um, And I really felt like the way I developed my critical care, or I'm sorry, critical thinking for the floor was different than critical care, but there still the the concepts were the same. So um, thank you guys for listening. And if you um, want to... um, check out our cheat sheets. We've got cheat sheets. We've got a great blog post about this. Um, It is critical thinking and care plans go together like chicken and waffles. I know it. I know they sound like they don't go together guys, but I promise they do. Absolutely promise. So, and we actually also have cheat sheets and I want to make sure I give you um, the right place to go find the cheat sheets. Um, So let me pull up your cheat sheets for you. Here we go. So basically, you'll go to um, nrsng.com. I'm sorry, nrsng.com slash care plan template. And you can go there and get this free cheat sheet on a template for a care plan. And remember, care plans, critical thinking, they both go together. So I just want to encourage you to check that out. I think it's going to be really helpful. Check out that blog post. Got a lot of great info on there. Helpful things about subjective and objective data. Um, help Tips for critical thinking. Um, not just examples, but practical tips. And practical tips for walking through a care plan and how you can um, really rock creating a care plan so hope you guys enjoyed this and check out my other episodes all right guys thanks for listening to this episode on critical thinking and nursing care plans i hope this was helpful for you guys i hope it's going to help you kind of piece together how to critically think as a nurse and then what that means and how the, the the nursing care plan is really so vital to everything that we do. I know we hate them. I know they're difficult, uh, but it's really everything that we do in nursing is critical thinking around the care plan of the patient. All right, that's what we're doing. We're providing care for a patient, and that's what this is all about. So head over to nrsng.com slash critical thinking to get this massive outline post with, with audio, with video, 
with explanations, with examples, and with the free template of nursing care plans. That's nrsng.com slash critical thinking. All right, guys, we appreciate everything that you do. We appreciate you being part of this NRSNG family. We are growing. We are reaching nearly every country in the world, and you guys are part of that. You guys are everything that we do at NRSNG, okay? I want you guys to know that. This isn't about us. This is about you guys, and you're the heart and soul of everything we do. So with that said, you guys know what time it is now. It's time to go out and be your best self today. Happy nursing. <laughs>